what is it that you're looking forward to uh, it being able to achieve? Has it achieved value? Ask the same question just the night before he has to write his thesis chapter, and you're likely to get a different answer. Ask the same question a year later when they're still unemployed, you might get yet a different question. And so the study traces these students five years into their career to be able to trace them at different points to look at what's the decision making that's going on and then feed back into understanding what are the curricular programmatic implications for the study. It does a range of disciplines. But so what the study actually assists us to do to think about doctoral education as a process of a continuous decision making and an evolving and changing process. And therefore it's important when you ask the study, how you ask the questions and why you're asking the questions to begin with. Um, so if you ask them on the night of their graduation, how satisfied are you with your doctoral education program? I'm sure all the gowns will be smiling, <laughs> okay? So it's likely to be different if you ask them a month later when they can't get a job, okay? And so, so the question is, what exactly is going under the microscope? Of course, I think it's a useful technique that marketing and publicity uh, uh, parts of the institution could start thinking about how do you attract people to get into doctoral education to begin with? Is institutional reputation an important issue? How is a reputation built? Okay, uh, all of these studies nevertheless are within stable economies. Uh, the labor market can absorb these individuals in the UK. What would happen if we have a downturn in the economy with the concept of doctoral education shift and change? Or what would happen if we move the study to a developing world context where the question about employment seems to be more of an issue than about luxurious PhDs? I don't believe they're luxurious, but uh, the issue is, should we be dealing with the masses of individuals who need employment or the individuals of doctoral education and how they're entering into the economy? And if we had a global downturn, would this mean that the whole study changes? And it's interesting, there are already studies being conducted in 2011 and 2012. The original studies in the Science Foundation were largely in 2010 and earlier. We're already beginning to see that the value of the PhD is being rethought. So what exactly are we studying? Are we actually studying the labor market or are we studying doctoral education? as we engage with such a process. I think we need to be clear what is being studied. Clarify what you're trying to do. Are these concerned with whether the PhD is employed, whether they find it useful? Are they satisfied? There's a whole range of issues, but what's happening is that the waters are getting muddy as we try, try to understand what we're trying to do with doctoral education. So, note that this particular study didn't actually focus anything on the international student, even though the UK has a large percentage, in fact, a large percentage of UKs are surviving on the, in, on the international students coming into their university systems as opposed to local students. The question is, why aren't they studying what's happening of the border crossings that's happening in international studies? You can see herein lies yet another area for further studies. How does the curriculum change of Harvard or Cambridge or Oxford when we have a larger majority of students who are international students? Does the curriculum change? Should it change? If not, why not? Now, in the Wellcome Trust, by contrast, I was interested only in one issue. They, they, you read the study to see how they look at postdoctoral students. But what they were trying to do is try to look at who are the individuals who don't respond to the questionnaire. Nice study, isn't it? <laughs> Instead of looking at who responds to the questions, ask who's not responding, and they call them outliers. Why are they not responding? 
And when they start probing there, they become a huge methodological source of information about why they're not answering this question. And so you can see, I'm just interested in a, another methodological way of dealing with these issues. So here is the issue. There are some repeated concerns about doctoral education and doctoral career path studies. The first of them is it's extremely costly. Who's gonna pay for it? NRF has just pulled out in the PPR project, for example. Who's gonna pay for these doctoral studies? Will the Dean of Research fund such a, such a study? Who's going to fund such research projects? They're costly. And what we're seeing is quite clearly the difficulty of securing funding, and this is a threat to doctoral career path studies to begin with. There's also a degree of skepticism emerging to ask, is this about nostalgia as we're engaging with uh, doctoral career path studies? Um, are, the met are the studies methodologically robust enough? Are they cost effective? Are they worthwhile? Why should we do them at all? Who's going to do these studies as well? So here are a series of validity questions that come about. Uh, the nostalgia or selective memory issue. Um, when do you ask the doctoral students? Um, just after they've graduated about whether it's valuable or not. So I have pointed to the other issue about the one-to-one -one utilitarian way of understanding value. So I'm uh, moving on to France. In France, the idea is of establishing a partnership between three competing groups. The first group is a contracting company who is usually, a, could be a small group of two to 10 people or a large group, sometimes more than 200 people, who contract a doctoral student as an employee to conduct research on their behalf while they're studying at the university. A completely different model from being em in the university and then getting employed. Here you're employed and simultaneously a doctoral, graduate, a doctoral student. I thought it was only engineers and scientists who were involved with it, but what we look at when we look at the study, it's humanities, arts, education, social sciences, political science, theology, the full range, who all establish what might be regarded as an on or off campus site, which is funded by the contracting company. And then that company engages with some kind of professional or academic pursuit. And it includes undergraduate and postgraduate studies. And they establish a laboratory. What this does is contract the doctoral student as an employee. So the most important function is that you first an employee, then a doctoral student. And you can see this immediately sets up a different kind of relationship in these particular studies. So herein lies my question. So what will drive the innovation or the development of these particular individuals? Will the economy drive the pursuit of the doctoral study or will the knowledge direct the, uh, the, the nature of the study. Will higher education become merely a servant of the employees, uh, sorry, of the employers as we engage in such a study? Can higher education then step outside of their brief to carve a niche out of the role that has been set up already by the employing agency? So for example, if Muntek contracts you, can you step outside of Mintech's agenda to be able to study something that actually goes against its very principles of the organization? So what exactly is driving the doctoral education study to begin with? Here we have an issue about knowledge production being compromised. And yet when I perhaps put up the slide and the first, many people thought, well, maybe this is a wonderful model. In fact, most of the individuals end up having a very healthy cooperative relationship between these different um, uh, companies. But what is driving the research agenda is my question. So the findings actually show that we expect that most of these graduates will get employed. But in fact, 
only 54% of them do get employed in large companies, in the large companies. of these students actually get a job within three months and 90% within six months. So if doctoral education is about employment, this is a wonderful model. And you can see, we need to be then asking, what are we trying to do as we engage with doctoral studies? So let's step aside and let's look at what these studies have taught us. I think these studies have taught us something about the competing layers that they're all engaging with trying to understand what we mean by doctoral education. They all push and pull in many different directions. I won't spend too much time on this because I'll come back in my closing remarks about this. But the fundamental missing dimension in all of these studies is it's not examining power. It's not examining the hegemony that dominates in each of these studies. A dominant discourse is perpetuating the conception of what doctoral education is. And those understandings of what the hallmarks of quality education are what is driving the higher education system to be thinking about doctoral education. So I'm suggesting that these agendas are being driven outside of education rather than within education. I'm also interested in how can we transport these studies constructed largely in a developed world context into a developing world context. Will the questions be different? And I'm seeing a new form of colonialism emerging, a kind of knowledge economy being exported like colonialism was exported to the colonies. We're having a new exportation of colonialism in a knowledge colonialism that's emerging in the nature of our studies. We may not be choosing appropriately the quality of our doctoral career path. So therefore, I'm suggesting, like Wal Hooter is suggesting, let's talk about patterns of privilege and power that are present in our doctoral career path studies, in our doctoral education research. New questions need to be asked about hierarchy and privilege. And therefore, we must understand our own implicatedness in the kind of research agenda in a global society as we engage with this. So I want to look at alternative metaphors. Should we be looking at doctoral education as a career path, a career track? because it suggests that there's an end point where we all know where we're going. What if we looked at doctoral education as growing out of a particular context rooted in the realities of its specificities and then allowing spaces for branches to grow in which others can come roost and nest? Now you can see if we're working with that metaphor, it's a completely different metaphor to say, let's talk about doctoral career paths. What if we looked at doctoral education as a process of being a gardener, right? The process of actually reconstructing according to seasonal varieties. Those seasonal varieties might be political, social, economic. If we thought about doctoral education in that metaphor, would we think in a different way of how to methodologically design the study? So, I'm against this dominance of survey methodologies. We need to ask questions also about who's doing the research, how we're borrowing our methodologies, whose interests are being served by the methodology we use, and who are we writing for? Are we writing for policymakers? Are we writing our doctoral career path studies for funders, for employers? Who exactly is the target audience of our doctoral education? So, for me, doctoral education must be about social reconstruction. I'm therefore going to propose a model. Um, move away from these dominant methodologies that we have and start thinking about alternative ways of thinking about the studies. Skipping some of these because you could read them uh, in the paper. I want to talk about the background of life history research that I'm drawing from of trying to understand the biographical forces that individuals bring to bear 
when they engage with doctoral education. But is it a question that we destined by these particular backgrounds? Are we predetermined? If you were born in the Cape Flats, does that mean that you will remain there? Does that mean that your biography predisposes you to remain situated in your specificity? And I think that's problematic. So therefore, we, we should be moving to disrupting our biographies, a biographical kind of suicide in which our institution has the possibility through higher education of offering a different future. That's what higher education is for, offering the possibility for being other, other than where you come from, not just your background, but also to present your foreground. What do you want to move forward aspirationally? We also should be thinking then about how we design curriculums in a programmatic way. How do we design curricula in the taught curriculum, in the court curriculum, in the learned curriculum? How do we work to move our curricula to provide different quality experiences for our doctoral graduates, our doctoral students? And therefore, I'm suggesting that needs to be mediated by the contextual forces that surround us, macro contextual forces and the micro contextual forces. This particular model will allow us to understand our landscape better, to pre predispose us to a particular perspective, to be able to think about the intersection of these different forces, which in my doctoral study I called a force field model of teacher professional development, trying to understand the intersection of professional identity, identity being pushed and pulled in different directions by these force fields, by these different factors in a force field. So what I'm suggesting is that we could equally apply this intersection to understand the concept of what I'm referring to in this new model on doctoralness. Doctoralness is at the intersection of all of these forces. We are shaped and we will be shaped by our context. We shape it. We are both structured and agentic. We are able to move to a new future. And that is the model that I'm proposing that could be used to activate newer studies and newer methodological approaches to doctoral education and career path studies. So, what does this mean for UKZN? Now, a, an example would be, if UKZN positions itself as the premier university of African scholarship, it is paradoxically poised to do two things. The one possibility, it could be an active source of development for the continent. On the other, it could be a colonizing influence. How are those two agendas being brought and understood in competition with each other, in dialogue with each other? And I th this is an example of the kinds of ways in which we could use this particular model to perpetuate new studies. I'm going to end with a, a, a concept from Amartya Sen um, on development as freedom and his views about a concept of freedoms and expanding freedoms. And he's the Nobel uh, laureate on economics from India who suggests to us that we need to be thinking about development as freedom. What quality of freedoms are we engendering? I would also like to draw on the Turkish philosopher Gulan, who Fethullah Gulan is a Turkish activist talking about a new philosophical approach to how we understand our purpose and function in education. Amartya Sen says to us, Development is not narrowly the pursuit of an individual material wealth. It is not the growth, it is not simply the growth of the national product. Development is not about the rise of industrialization. It's not just about technological advancement. It's not about social modernization. It's about all of those things in dialogue and in contest 
with each other as they compete for different supremacies. And this is what our force field model is suggesting as we're engaging with trying to look at doctoral career path studies not in isolation of the multiple kaleidoscope of forces. So when we think about quality of doctoral education, we should be thinking about the quality of expanding freedoms that it has engendered. What quality has it contributed to the development of the society? Our freedom is not a singular concept. It's a plural, multiple, and contested phenomenon. To put it in Gulan's words, Gulan says, we need to see ourselves as the intersection between self and society, between the individual and the collective, between the present and the future, between the practical and, yes, the spiritual dimension also in doctoral education. We need to be joining up the mundane and the eternal. These are insights to my growth as a doctoral um, researcher. And therefore, if we're asking what is significant research, the concept of what significance to me is to answer this question. Are our doctoral candidates embracing responsibility for both the local and the global force of ideas towards realizing greater freedoms? That is what doctoral education is, towards realizing our greater freedoms. How do we develop this? How do we understand what is worthwhile education? We need to be thinking practically, personally, emotionally, clinically, and theoretically. Doctoral education is produced in the kaleidoscope of all of these forces. I thank you. esteemed inaugurant, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the College of Humanities, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Teaching and Learning, the University Dean of Research, deans and heads of schools, um, colleagues and friends. It is my privilege to say a few words of thanks this evening. And of course, the few words of thanks has to go first and foremost to our esteemed inaugurant, Professor Michael Samuel. Thank you so much, Michael, for that inspiring um, and uh, challenging uh, lecture. We really appreciate it. I think that the people that appreciate it most in the audience are those who have sat at your feet. And so I, I, I join with them in, in thanking you. Um, I want to call upon Dr. Naina Amin from the School of Education, um, who is the academic, she's the academic leader of research, and she wants to make a presentation to to Professor Samuel this evening. I should advise you while she's coming up that um, uh, she and others have been instrumental in putting up a display of Michael's work um, outside in the foyer so that you all are able to see that he earned this professorship. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to place on record our thanks to the University uh, of KwaZulu-Natal for providing a space for Michael to develop, um, and more so not only for him to develop in his own career, but I think to develop the hundreds of students that have sat underneath him. I think it's very easy. Michael was talking about navel-gazing when one is a professor to, to look within. But I think what is so special about his career is that he's developed other people and he continues to develop other people. And that goes beyond the 17 students that he's graduated. So thank you, Michael, for that as well. Um, thank you for, uh, to everyone here who have come to share in this momentous occasion um, with Professor Samuel. It is indeed a momentous occasion. It is indeed a celebration 
celebration, so thank you for, for joining us. I've also been asked to ask you to join us for refreshments, um, which have been um, very generously provided by the university. Thank you all once again. Please will you stand as we sing the national anthem. <laughs> 